you can do at home to keep your hands healthy. On our special town hall, Hope and Healing, Treating Hand Pain, we're gonna look at some common and uncommon issues that can affect your hands. Plus, we have an expert panel to explore the problems and solutions. Next. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. Welcome to Hope and Healing, Treating Hand Pain. I'm Olga Villaverde. We don't think about how complicated and serious a hand injury can be until something goes wrong. Here are some quick numbers. Up to 5% of the adult population is affected by carpal tunnel syndrome. Nearly one in two women will develop osteoarthritis in their hands by 85. Traumatic hand injury can cause up to nearly 30% of emergency room visits. So let me introduce our guest for this town hall. First, my usual co-host who is joining us virtually today, Dr. Michael Zinner. He's the CEO and executive director of Miami Cancer Institute and Baptist Health Cancer. Care. Also, Dr. Elizabeth Wallet, Chief of Hand Surgery at Miami Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute. Dr. Matthew Treiser, Chief of Microsurgery and Extremity Reconstruction at Miami Cancer Institute. And Dr. Roy Cardoso is a hand and upper extremity surgeon at Baptist Health Orthopedic Care. A pleasure to have all of you with me today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. Now, before we begin, I'd like to remind you at home that if you have a question for our panel, all you have to do is email us to questions at allhealthtv.com. It's right there. That's questions at allhealthtv.com. So we have a lot to cover today, but first I want to start with carpal tunnel. I think just about everyone has heard of it. So here's a short video. Take a look. Numbness in some of your fingers could be caused by a number of different reasons, and one of them is carpal tunnel syndrome. And this is basically the carpal tunnel ligament. The median nerve is this yellow structure. Carpal tunnel syndrome is pressure on that nerve. Many times the cause may not be apparent, but is associated with frequent repetitive movements. And patients will generally complain of numbness and tingling. It mainly happens at nighttime. If ignored, carpal tunnel can lead to difficulties doing everyday activities like dressing. Women have difficulty doing their bra. Men have difficulty doing the top button on their shirt. Wearing a wrist brace at night can ease symptoms, and a steroid injection may help, although the effects can wear off over time. If neither works, the next option is surgery to open the tunnel and relieve the pressure. Dr. Wallet, let me start with you. Can you expand a little bit more on just what carpal tunnel syndrome is, please? Well, it's basically a compartment syndrome. In other words, the median nerve is traveling through a very narrow canal uh, that the transverse carpal ligament covers. And the pressure goes up inside. And we've actually monitored the pressure and found it gets up to as much as 100 milligrams uh, of mercury. And normal tissue, soft tissue pressure would be like 10 or 16. So this is an, an incredible increase in pressure there. Uh, that is caused by metabolism, hormones, genetics, and anatomy. So there's actually a gene 17 that can cause this. Anatomy with a small wrist and very big muscles can cause this, as well as hormones, which is why women tend to get this more than men, particularly up to age 45, 55. But believe it or not, men are kicking in at the 55 and up group because their hormones start to shift as they get older and the metabolism. So if you can diminish the inflammation that you're going through, uh, through a number of different things that uh, you can take care of, that will improve stuff. Turns out not to be related to typing. Typing will aggravate it, but it doesn't cause it. And there's only one job that we've ever been able to link to causing carpal tunnel, and that is using a jackhammer. So you're, you're hammering uh, with uh, you know, a laboratory tool that has a great deal of power. Those people, that's a paper uh, out of Australia, proved that a jackhammer is related to carpal tunnel in the workforce. But otherwise, we have not been able to do that. Thank you, Dr. Wallet. Dr. Treiser, let me bring you in. What are some of the symptoms people should be aware of? Because I've never had it, but I know my mother sometimes suffers in some areas of the hand, and sometimes I say, hmm, I wonder if that's carpal tunnel. How would she know? 
Well, every patient suffers from different symptoms, but some of the most common symptoms that patients report are numbness, particularly of the thumb, index, and middle finger. And they'll also report, report sometimes electrical sensations throughout the hand. They'll feel the loss of dexterity in their hand and the ability to you know, do fine motor tasks. And those are the most common symptoms. And often they occur at night and patients note that they have to shake out their hands to try to get the symptoms to feel better. And Dr. Cardoso, when you have a patient coming in and they're saying, you know, I'm feeling some of these symptoms, do they usually have it for a long time and they just didn't know? And are they, have they waited too long? Or is it one of those things that they feel it and they come see you? Dr. Cardoso, can you hear me? All right, we'll get Dr. Cardoso in just a second. But Dr. Zinner, I'm going to bring you in. And I think this is something I know you can relate to because you and I were talking before this town hall started and you shared with me, and I know you don't mind me sharing with our viewers, that you were diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome. Can you share what you felt, how long you had it, and then what came of it? So, Olga, that's <clears throat> correct. So I had been a surgeon for over 35 years, and I'd used my left hand to retract in surgery. And after a couple of hours of operating, I discovered that the three fingers on my, fing on my hand were getting numb, and I'd actually had to stop the operation and recover before I could move on. I then got tested by, uh, uh, by motor testing and, and nerve testing and found to have bilateral carpal tunnel. So I've had that experience before. And Dr. Zinner, just as a follow-up, did you have surgery? So it ended up, uh, Olga, that I did have surgery. I ended up having it on both wrists, not at the same time. And that brings me to the question that I'd like to ask Dr. Treiser. Can you tell us the other options besides surgery? What are the non-surgical options available to us for treating carpal tunnel. Some of the most common non-surgical treatments for carpal tunnel include wearing a splint, often at night when we're splinting, and steroid injections. And these can provide relief of these symptoms, and even this can be permanent or it can be temporary. But the people have also looked at other things that they can do, including physical therapy. Um, some people have used ultrasound therapy to help uh, with carpal tunnel syndrome. Some patients have tried oral steroids, which has been shown to help um, at least temporarily with their symptoms, and even yoga and ergonomic devices, particularly when you're typing, to just help to see if that can alleviate some of the symptoms. And Dr. Treiser, let me pick up on that. When you talk about yoga, what do you mean? Because when I think about yoga, I'm thinking about stretching, being on the floor, putting my hands on the floor. What type of yoga? So people have looked at different types of yoga, um, you know, whether it's the, the stretching, as you mentioned, um, trying to not necessarily doing downward dog per se, because that puts a lot of pressure on the carpal tunnel. Exactly. But doing just stretching exercises that can help kind of release the pressure that's on the nerve, as Dr. Ouellette said, that causes carpal tunnel to occur. And there have been some results that indicate that it can help, but it's still, uh, people are still looking at it and really haven't come to as to whether it's a viable non-operative or, you know, solution as opposed to splinting and steroid injections. And Dr. Wallet, let's talk then about uh, surgery. If a patient needs surgery, and always that's the last resort, what can they expect, uh, I guess, from the surgery and from the recovery as well? So a lot of people are worried that they waited too long to get the surgery or that uh, they can do a lot of other different things. So I try and map it out for people that you have such and such symptoms, you have deficits on exam, either sensation or motor. And now the question is, uh, what's the nerve conductions? We look at those to make a decision, are you ready for surgery or not? So if you do the surgery, it depends on how you do it. All roads lead to Rome. In other words, they're all the ways that we do it, 95% success rate with a 5% recurrence. And, uh, and so that's with open, mini open, endoscopic, whether it's one portal or two portals, uh, and including now ultrasound with uh, uh, a, uh, a special knife that uh, you do it with ultrasound. And so you can do it through one small incision. And all of these ways allow you to return to uh, work and to uh, using your hand 
pretty quickly with the exception of the open the open method which is a much bigger incision so you end up with an incision coming along here and uh, that takes a bit longer for you to feel comfortable using but most endoscopics you can feel pretty comfortable right away there's a number of times where people might make you afraid that waiting too long uh, would uh, lead to permanent damage so I'm here to tell you as a young hand surgeon I knew I had carpal tunnel but of course, I didn't have time because I had babies, I had surgery, I was every other night call, level one trauma. Well, who's got time? And I kept waiting and waiting in seven years to finally get it done. Well, the good news about waiting that seven years is that the uh, endoscopics became available at the end of that seven years. So I ended up doing both of my hands at the same time and, and then was back to work uh, within two weeks. And, uh, and nowadays, you know, people can really turn around within one to two weeks of getting back to normal stuff. And if you're typing in an office, you can actually get back pretty quickly. The key is elevate your hands, move them, take some breaks. If you have to, to remind yourself to get your hands up and move them, set a timer, you know, like one of those oven timers at your, your desk or your watch telling you every hour or so, get your hands up, move them, and then get back to doing what you want to do. So the, the recovery from this is very, very fast now with the exception that they're scarring and that scar takes time for that to heal in and it's truly remodeling for up to a year. Uh, and so I had trouble cutting a wire in the OR for about three months and felt comfortable, but then six months before I could take a bolt cutter and cut thick re for uh, external fixators that we put on for distal radius fractures. And so I tell those things to patients. The other problem is the longer you wait to you know, do the surgery, and it's okay to wait, but it just takes a little bit longer for the nerve to come back and mm -hmm. has to wake up. And so I always tell people it's like a relationship. So it's like a child who left. It's the prodigal child, they left home. They didn't call, they didn't write. You don't know whether they're living or dead. Day of surgery, they show up at your front doorstep. Of course you invite them in for dinner. After dinner, what, you all of a sudden have a relationship with this child? Did you hold their room like a shrine in perpetuity that that child could walk back in and occupy exactly the same way the day they left it? Of course you didn't, and neither does your brain. This is brain plasticity. It's not gonna leave these neurons doing nothing. They shift and do other things. So that all those relationships have to come back. So give yourself time, one to two years to feel normal. It'll be there, it'll be functioning, but it won't feel exactly right. That's the relationship, give it time. Thank you, Dr. Wallet. Thank you for your personal story and the examples. They were fantastic. We have a question from a viewer who says, I'm on the computer a lot, and I've noticed that after a day of working on it for hours, sometimes my pinky on my mouse hand feels numb. Is that carpal tunnel? So, you know, Dr. Zinner, a few minutes ago, you were talking about your three fingers, right? Yeah, you know, I'm used to thinking of carpal tunnel involving these three fingers uh, and not the pinky. So let me turn to Dr. Treiser. Can you help answer the question for the viewer? Yeah, traditionally, Dr. Zinni, you are exactly right. It's these three fingers that are involved. Um, and the small finger is usually not involved. Um, the, the small finger is really supplied by a different nerve called the ulnar nerve. Um, so you are absolutely correct. It's usually those three fingers. Thank you, Dr. Treiser. So we want to talk now about other conditions that can affect your hands, such as small growths and bumps. This next video is an example of one. Take a look at this. When I was a little girl, um, my mom took me to the doctor because I had some sort of like bump cyst in my middle finger on my right hand. And according to my mom, I was born with it. So about five years ago, I realized that this was really bothering me in the sense that I would, you know, grab things or um, pick up things or just bump into things. And I may, you know, notice the pain or um, the contact, or I may not have, but then days later, I would notice that the finger was hurting that specific area. And also that it was getting like purplish, greenish sometimes. I was like, I, I need to get this done because it was really bothering me. It was hurting a lot. Surgery was really like intense because even though it's um, not general anesthesia, which perhaps I would have felt better had it been general anesthesia, it was local anesthesia.
there's a screen and they put a tourniquet around your arm and then they, um, you know, anesthetize that section or that area. And it's like really, really cold. It's almost like frost frostbite. And then it feels really, really warm and you don't know what they're doing. <laughs> it was bandaged like a, a boxing glove. Um, so I, I didn't know what they had done. And, um, and I had to be with that boxing glove for about a month and now it doesn't hurt. I have full motion. I can close my fist. And that's great to hear. Dr. Cardoso, she was diagnosed with a hemangioma. How common are they? If you can explain, please. in the hand they're they're relatively common um they're the most common benign tumor of the hand um so they do happen frequently but they're not they're not cancerous they can be treated fairly easily and doctor as a follow-up there are other types of cysts or tumors that can develop in the hand can you expand on that for me oh sure uh, there are multiple kinds of tumors that can develop in the hand. Again, only about 5% of tumors that happen in the hand are, are cancerous. About 90, The rest of them, 95%, are not. But some of them, common names are uh, like lipoma, which is a fatty tumor. Uh, you can get something that has a scary name, but that is not scary. It's called a giant cell tumor. Um, you get cysts in the hand, very commonly associated with arthritis. You can have cysts that develop around the fingers. Some of the tumors that develop in the hand are related to skin conditions like uh, basal cell tumors or uh, <clears throat> squamous cell tumors. There are cysts that can develop inside the bone. Uh, <clears throat> some, some of them are made out of cartilage, some of them are made out of bone. Can I add to the hemangioma discussion? Of course, Dr. Wallet, please do. Uh, well, with hemangiomas, 50% of babies are born with a hemangioma someplace because you're in growth mode. Uh, but the majority of those involute and go away. Those are those little strawberry hemangiomas you see on babies' backs, etc. And there'll be occasionally some that are left in the hand. But the majority of those go away. Now, there's some that start to go haywire. They never are malignant, but they're aggressive. They steal blood supply. And so some of those tumors can make it difficult. So even though it's a benign tumor, uh, if it starts to grow, uh, you do want to get it checked out and you do want to get uh, uh, a study in such a way that you can tell, do you have more? Because there's skip lesions to these hemangiomas. They go in kind of a, a nerve distribution. And so you'll get one in your finger, one up in your arm, and another back up at your shoulder. Most of those you don't have to deal with. It's usually just the one in your hand that's causing the steal, but you can get them in the forearm as well. And so just be aware, very rare when you get into that, but uh, uh, there are a number of people that will deal with that from hand surgeons to the uh, interventional radiologists. Thank you, doctor, very much. Uh, moving on now, one in four American adults have arthritis. It's the leading cause of work disability and it can certainly affect your hands. Arthritis of the hand can be painful and in some cases disfiguring. Now there are three common types. Let's show you what they are. Osteoarthritis is the most common and affects over 32 million adults in the United States. Rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory disease causing the joint lining to swell and psoriatic arthritis affects your skin and joints. Uh, Dr. Treiser, let me bring you in. Let's start with osteoarthritis since it is the most common. Can you explain what it is and how it can affect your hands? So as you said, osteoarthritis is the most common arthritis and it's really an arthritis that's based on wear and tear. If we live long enough and use our joints enough, we will all develop osteoarthritis in our joints because the cartilage surface, which is the joint surface that allows for movement across the joint, over time starts to wear down and develops kind of breaks in the cartilage. And over time, this will cause the bone to basically rub on the bone, and this will cause inflammation and pain. And that's why arthritis causes pain. It can really affect any joint of the body, but there are certain joints that are more common, and in the hand, there are certain joints that are more common as well, including the thumb joint, which is the basal joint of the thumb, which is right here, as well as the joints involving the distal portions of the fingers, 
that can be commonly affected with hand arthritis. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Cardoso, I just got a question from a viewer. Uh, his name is Jacob. Let me read it to you and see if you can answer it for us, if you don't mind. Jacob wants to know about different surgical treatments for arthritis. What do the operations entail and how extensive are they? Dr. Cardoso? So uh, there's a couple of treatment, surgical treatments for arthritis, depending on what kind of arthritis it is and which joint is being affected. Uh, so sometimes we fuse bones together. So sometimes the, the space between two bones is so severely affected that uh, the only way to alleviate pain and to correct deformity, because sometimes arthritis does cause the fingers to become crooked, is to fuse the bones together. And then sometimes um, we're able to actually replace the joints with artificial materials, either metal or silicone. Um, so essentially we create a new space out of an artificial material that helps to realign the joint and to, to give the patient some pain relief. And then sometimes, particularly at the uh, base of the thumb, as Dr. Treiser was pointing out, we actually remove a bone and fill that space up with a tendon or some other artificial material to give that joint some space. And that also alleviates pain, but helps us to maintain motion. And Dr. Wallet, let me follow up with you. Uh, what about non-surgical treatments for osteoarthritis? Can we expand on those? Uh, yes, uh, you can use splints, topical anti-inflammatories, that's kind of Western medicine, uh, injections, uh, both uh, steroid and we're now moving into using more uh, amniotic fluid and those kinds of things we, that hasn't really been uh, tested well enough yet to know for sure whether that's going to help, uh, but it does appear that it's going that direction. Uh, the other thing is, and I tell people this all the time, and they ask me because I have hereditary osteoarthritis, and so you can see the lumps in my fingers and uh, and you can see that my thumb is a slightly uh, sublux there, and there's a good grind if somebody puts their finger there. And if you look at my x-rays, I look as bad as most of my patients. There's almost no cartilage, but I move beautifully. And uh, so what's, what's the trick there? And I tell them, you've got to lose weight. You have to lose weight. Why? Because fat is its own entity. It's like an organ by itself, and it makes leptin and a number of other hormones and things that cause inflammation and they directly attack cartilage and joints. If you can reduce the amount of fat that you're carrying, you will help reduce the amount of inflammation of your joints. Who makes fat? Just like the TV ad, cortisol. Who's making the cortisol? The liver. Why? It's under stress. Toxic. So two simple things that you can do is go organic, but like a heart attack. And so in your food and in your skincare, because anything you put on your skin, it's seconds in your bloodstream. So you really want to try and clean up everything you can in your diet and in your skincare. The second thing you want to do to lose weight is no pattern. Pick five styles of eating, five styles of exercise, mix it up every day. Don't do the same thing every day, because if you do, sure, that first 10 days, we all, we've all done this. You lose your 10 to 20 pounds, you're like, wow, this is really working. And then bam, the door shuts. Why did it shut? You told your body you were heading into an ice age. And it says, eh, I got to conserve every calorie for 20,000 years of extreme cold. And our, as homo sapiens, we have about five interglacial ice ages memory in us. And with our Neanderthal genes, you add another 10 because they live for a million years across the 39th parallel of Europe and into Mongolia. So that's our genetic lineage, and that's what you're telling it. Don't tell it that. And so mix it up, no pattern. And those things will help. And I've had many people come back to me and say, I thought you were a little woo-woo crazy, but I was so desperate, I tried. And darned if you're not right. And so it does work. If you can diminish the inflammation in your life, it will help you with your arthritis. I think anything you would suggest, I would do as a patient as soon as possible, Dr. Wallet. Thank you so much. Another type of arthritis that can affect the hands is rheumatoid arthritis. Take a look at this. It can be hereditary, and women are two to three times more likely than men to develop it. Dr. Zinner, I believe you have a question for Dr. Wallet. Let me turn it over to you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dr. Well, let, let, let's let's expand a little bit on that. For, for our audience, can you expand on the difference between the rheumatoid arthritis and the osteoarthritis you just described? 
Well, rheumatoid arthritis, there's a genetic component to it, but there's also a viral component to it. In other words, if you have an, a viral infection of some kind, it can trigger rheumatoid arthritis. And we didn't, we were guessing at that before. We had an inclination. After COVID-19, we now know it, it can trigger rheumatoid arthritis. And we've seen a, a major increase in uh, rheumatoid patients and the, their symptoms, et cetera. So the rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory response that directly attacks the cartilage. And with that, there's, a very, there's some very key patterns. In other words, your wrist starts to get the arthritis and it starts to subluxate this direction. So the whole wrist shifts this way. And, and when it does that, it starts to pull your tendons. So your joints go into ulnar drift and then go into flexion and dislocate volally. So then you get this funny pattern that's rheumatoid arthritis which can then go into this kind of a deformity with boutonniere deformities or swan neck deformities, and, uh, which is like that. And, uh, so, and that's all because of the loss of the joint structures that stabilize those joints, and that is the ligaments and the capsule around in addition to the cartilage, and then the muscles getting tight and everything shifting. Whereas osteoarthritis, it's also got a genetic component to it. I blame the uh, Scandinavians traveling all over. You can track their migration patterns through this arthritis pattern. Uh, and uh, because it's both this, these knobs here, the knobs on your joints are forming because your cartilage is thinning. And when it thins, the joint then rocks back and forth. And, uh, and so when it rocks, Mother Nature does not like instability. So she makes these extra knots here on the side to make the ligaments now have tension and stabilize out. And so that's what those are. And that truly is hereditary and you can't really stop it. It's on the march, it's gonna do its thing. Psoriatic arthritis is another variety of rheumatoid arthritis, but it only really attacks out here at the distal uh, interphalangeal joints. And you can also have psoriatic skin issues uh, but that doesn't necessarily you always do. You can have the arthritis without the psoriasis and the skin patches. Uh, so for the osteoarthritis, I will war tell people, please just wear a Band-Aid and use like Voltaren mm -hmm. or Arnica or any of these anti-inflammatory agents. The Band-Aid will increase the strength of that joint two times. And we know this from the biomechanics lab. We know that if you just take a Publix brown paper bag and wrap it around the tibia, you will increase the strength of that tibia two times. So mm -hmm. you, we don't need anything fancy. So just the Band-Aid is enough. Wear that at night. Wear it when you're typing and writing if you're having a bad day. So those things will help with that arthritis, and that's the difference. Rheumatoid is a whole other ballgame. We're chasing that, but fortunately, we've got the biologics. This is where you want to get hooked into a rheumatologist. And I always tell my patients before we even embark on surgical options, are you doing any of the uh, IV treatments or other treatments that the uh, rheumatologists have first? Do that first because we've really dropped the number of these cases that we see uh, because of that. So uh, that's the good news. There's a lot of ways around to avoid surgery now. Matt, I, I have a question for, for you as a follow-up. Now, Dr. Treasure just, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ouellette just gave a very uh, ex, uh, expanded explanation of rheumatoid and, and osteoarthritis, but I'm a patient. I'm a simple patient. I've got pain in my joints. How do I know the difference whether I've got osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or even psoriatic arthritis? So there are a number of ways that they're somewhat different in how patients present and the symptomatology that they may have. <clears throat> One of the most common things between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis is when the pain in the joints occurs. With rheumatoid arthritis, patients often complain of morning stiffness. When they wake up, their joints are very stiff, but as they start moving throughout the day, they'll actually feel their joints loosen up and will feel better. And with osteoarthritis, they'll see the exact opposite. They'll say throughout the day, as they're using their joints more and more, that it actually, the pain gets worse. The other thing with rheumatoid arthritis is it tends to affect joints very symmetrically. So if your left knee is involved or your right hand is involved, the contrary or other side will also be involved. Um, but so some of these little symptoms can be clues as to why you have one versus the other, but probably the best way to figure it out would be to see a hand sur surgeon 
so that they can examine you, take some x-rays, because there are some telltale signs that we can find to really steer you in the right direction. Thank you, Dr. Treiser. Uh, we've covered a lot here, and I do want to, Dr. Zinner, talk about treatments, because I know a lot of people want a little bit more information on that. And, uh, and sometimes I wonder about maybe medications, complications. So why don't we discuss that a little bit? So let, let me turn to uh, Dr. Wallet on this one, uh, which is what are the treatments, the, the biologics we talked about or the other treatments for any of the arthritis? Well, again, for osteoarthritis, you'd start with the basics of, you know, let's say meloxicam or Celebrex. If you want to take a pill, you could also use a short uh, dose of steroids, although we don't like to go steroids. Uh, because they have their own set of side effects. Uh, and the same is true for rheumatoid arthritis. Steroids used to be one of the first lines in, with aspirin. Uh, and aspirin's still a great drug for even rheumatoid arthritis, but you, you really don't want to do the steroids as much as you can avoid them. Uh, and that's where I leave it in the hands of the rheumatologist. Methotrexate, uh, you know, and Humira, and all these different uh, biologics and it's always changing. And how people respond to each of those. In other words, someone may do very well with Humira, but another not. And they keep changing them to find the one that works for you. And, uh, and so that's where you have to work very closely with a rheumatologist uh, on caring for the rheumatoid arthritic. The osteoarthritic, again, that's, that's just basic mechanical support. Uh, and when you can't stand it, then we start discussing surgical options. But I always warn people, the surgical outcome in osteoarthritis is the same now or five years from now. You have lost time. Rheumatoid, there can be a little bit of lost time. And why? Because the more dislocated and tighter the over they are, the harder it is to put arthroplasties in here. So that's, that's the juggle between the non-operative uh, care and then making the decision when to shift to operations. So let, let me let me take this, uh, uh, Dr. Cardosa, to you, which is, you know, I'm a cancer doctor, so I deal with immunocompromised patients all the time. Some of these medications are immunosuppressants, and so what do we have to? What do you have to worry about when you're treating these patients with these biologics that some of which are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed? What do you deal with? How do you deal with that in that patient population? So when it comes to surgery in particular, we have to be very aware of uh, some of these biologics and their immunocompromised state um, and the possibilities of wounds not healing or the possibility of an infection. And so sometimes we have to turn those medications off or taper the patients off these medications around the time that they're having surgery. And also have to inform those folks that they might be at an increased risk of having a wound problem or of having an infection. And so sometimes we give them home antibiotics where in a person who doesn't have those medications, we might not. Um, also, if we are doing something where we're fusing bones together, it sometimes takes twice as long for those folks for their bones to fuse together. And we have to keep those things in mind and, and taper expectations um, in those patients. Thank you, Dr. Cardoso. So I want to talk about accidents at work or even around the house. They can be extremely dangerous and debilitating. It's happened to me. Cooking, uh, exercising, yard work are just a few activities that can lead to some pretty serious problems. Uh, according to a 10-year analysis by the National Institutes of Health, nearly 650,000 cases of a hand, finger, or wrist injury were treated in an emergency department. Uh, Dr. Zinner, I'm actually going to go to you because You've obviously been in the ER many, many, many times in your life. This is a common problem. And I'm even going to bring up the what happened with the bagel on that Sunday. You know, the frozen bagel, the avocado. I mean, there's accidents that happen. And that's, by the way, well, that's I'm what happened to me. Uh, I'm just going to let you know that's what happened to me. Well, let me turn to Dr. Treiser. So, Dr. Treiser. We, all surgeons I know have spent time in the emergency room. What's the most common injury you see when you go to the emergency room or get called to the emergency room? Well, hopefully we're spending time treating patients and not as a patient. But 
now and then things do happen. The most common injury that I usually see around here, particularly now, is somebody who trips and falls on an outstretched arm and suffers a wrist fracture. But knife injuries from cooking in the house are got to be a close second where patients accidentally, as mentioned, cutting a bagel, cutting an avocado, just trying to slice a mango. Fruit can be very dangerous and can result in severe hand injuries. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Treiser. Uh, Dr. Wallet, I'm going to talk to you about this, too, because I know you have some examples. You've seen this as well. And uh, I remember it happened to me. I was actually cutting a frozen bagel, and it wasn't that bad, to be honest. But I had a friend of mine who really did do a lot of damage to her hand. Uh, what to do? What have you seen? Uh, you know, give me your insight, if you don't mind. Uh, well, anything where you're holding an object and you've got a knife and you're cutting it, you can see how you could cut the non-dominant hand, real easy. It's just pick a finger. And uh, and the trouble is that even just a sharp knife stabbing in here can catch both flexor tendons and or nerves. So I've seen people literally cutting labels, tags off of uh, fishing lines and then stabbing themselves and cutting both nerves and the two tendons. Uh, and, uh, and so when you get those situations, uh, now they, they, they instantly can't flex the finger. And, uh, and they're, they recognize right away something has happened. On the other hand, let's say they just stabbed it and bled in the area so they can still move. And there's a questioning kind of like, well, did I do something wrong? Is something bad here? And, uh, and so the bleeding can actually cause some issues that sometimes you just have to wash out the bleeding in order to get the tendons to move. Uh, and so there's, there's all different levels of things that you can do, including literally just amputating the finger. And, and, uh, and then you got to sew it back on. And that tries her specialty. <laughs> I used to be mine. Now it's his. <laughs> Indeed it is. Dr. Cardosa, your thoughts on this as well? I'm sure you've seen it happen in the past you know, as Dr. well. What, multiple traumas in the emergency room are, uh, to the hand? We see them all the time as hand surgeons. Um, fingers being cut, like Dr. Ouellette had mentioned, and Dr. Treiser as well, and then terrible fractures that are sometimes open that needs to be debrided and cleaned out right away. So, yes, we see a lot of these injuries on a frequent basis. You know, Olga, let me, I'd like to ask Dr. Treiser a follow-on question to that because we've all, not we all, but many of us have been in the emergency room where we've seen traumatic uh, amputations of fingers, obviously a terrible consequence, but when do you know, or how do you know, when to try to sew that back on and when not to sew that back on? I realize that's a, a consequential a traumatic event, but you're also on the receiving end of that and have to make some tough decisions. Yeah, it, it's a difficult problem to, and a discussion has to be had with the patient. There are a lot of things that go into deciding whether or not to put a finger back on, which we call replantation. Um, you know, things like how many fingers are off? Is it one? Is it multiple? Which finger is off? You would think that it wouldn't matter, but it does. In terms of the ultimate hand function, some fingers uh, participate more to the hand function than others. For example, you lose a thumb, you lose six percent of your hand function. So that's very important to put that back on. Um, the other things are patient factors. What is their occupation? What do they do? Which is it their dominant hand or non-dominant hand? And then even still, I'll have discussions with the patient about whether they want it put back on. You would think that everyone would come to the emergency room and want it put back on. But when you explain to them what can happen afterwards, what the function of the finger is, you'll be surprised that some patients will have a discussion with you as a practitioner and you'll come to a joint decision about whether or not it's right for that patient to put the finger back on. And you have to explain to them that there's going to be a lot of rehabilitation afterwards because putting it back on sometimes is the easiest part of it. And it's the rehabilitation afterwards and getting that finger functioning again later with the rehabilitation and the therapy that really makes or breaks the success of that operation. And Dr. Treiser, Thank I want you, you to stand by because we recently spoke with a young woman who almost lost a finger due to an accident. We have her video, but we want to warn you that some images may be disturbing. Take a look and we'll talk to Dr. Treiser right after. So I was at our warehouse um, at work and I was reaching up um, on an 
about an eight foot metal caged rack uh, to get some boxes at the top and the rack was a little rickety and I jumped down and my ring got caught on one of the top racks of the cages and quite literally ripped my finger off. I had what's called a complete degloving, so my finger was completely off. I ended up finding Dr. Roger Corey out of Key Biscayne, who was absolutely the only person that agreed to, to reattach my finger. He spent eight and a half hours doing this surgery and reattaching my finger without any um, reassurance that the surgery was gonna be successful. I had a huge cast for months, months and months. He did a couple other surgeries to add some skin grafts. I was really lucky. I feel like one in a million um, with getting my finger back. I can bend, it's, it's this middle finger here, um, and I can bend it almost all the way. I fully can't make a fist, but um, I can get it pretty, <laughs> pretty far down there, um, but I can bend it straight, I can hold things, I can grasp things. Um, it's been it's been crazy and it actually um, looks pretty great too. Can't complain. Oh my goodness, Dr. Treiser. I cringed when I saw that and yet look at her, thank goodness, your reaction. I mean, it's a great story. It Those is. injuries are some of the worst. Um, they actually have a name for it. It's called a ring avulsion because it's not an uncommon injury. People on their ring finger catch something, it just gets stuck, and it kind of rips the finger off. Mm -hmm. And it can be one of the most devastating injuries. And that's an, an amazing outcome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just shows what with good hand surgery and, you know, with a patient who is compliant with their post-operative care like she was, that you can have good results. Mm -hmm. But sometimes not every patient is a candidate for putting that finger back on like she was. But it was a wonderful story. And can I add to this? Of course, Dr. Wallet. Uh, one other thing that happens is when people are walking their dogs or they're leading their horse and they'll wrap the lead or the leash around a finger. This is when it also happens. Don't do that. Don't wrap it around your wrist. Don't wrap it around your thumb because thumb evulsions occur that way as well. And they're very difficult to get back on. Uh, and even though this young lady did it, that is, that's such a wonderful story, but it is not a common story because it's one of the reasons why we say with ring avulsions, sometimes better to do a resection, which is just to remove that entire finger, then you close the whole hand and they work very well. And, uh, and a stiff, painful finger in which you've tried to do that replant, and now you're a year, year and a half in, and the finger's very stiff and painful, you still go to a, an amputation. But people can function very well with that. Absolutely. Actually, I want to go to Dr. Cardoso as well. Cardoso, uh, Dr. Cardoso, any advice you would also give to people in terms of just protecting themselves from these injuries? So, um, I like to I, I like to work out. I uh, attend a gym, and, and we see this all the time where folks will work out with their rings on. Um, and to to reiterate what Dr. Treiser and Dr. Lett said, these are traumatic injuries and they're often not successfully uh, replanted or put back into place. They're very challenging because the ring pulls off and strips all of the tissue. And so I strongly advise folks, if you are going to work out to take off your rings and if you insist on wearing a ring, for them to be silicone so that you don't um, put yourself in that situation. Great advice there, Dr. Treiser. I got to bring you on this one as well. Any advice for our viewers? Because that could be very serious. And unfortunately, in many cases, it doesn't turn out like that beautiful woman did, who, by the way, she is a model. Yeah, no, it often doesn't. As Dr. Willett said and Dr. Cordoso said, oftentimes we can't put those fingers back on. I think whenever you do industrial work, not wearing your rings, I think wearing safety gloves when you're doing industrial work to make sure I'm, you know, down here, I don't really see it. But when I was up in and training we used to see patients putting their hands in snow blowers all the time but down here we see them putting their hands in lawn mowers so you got to be careful about you know, equipment particularly table saws you just got to be careful um make sure that the saw is off and don't put your hand anywhere near it and wear your safety equipment 
great advice. I want to turn now to the COVID pandemic. You know, during the pandemic, we know a lot of people couldn't see their doctors, and that played a, a pretty big role in their overall health. Dr. Zinner, you and I have spoken time and time again about this because there are repercussions for those who did not see their doctors. So uh, you all know on this call that uh, I've been involved with uh, cancer and we know that during COVID, there were delays in diagnosis of cancer and we know that about cardiovascular disease and it's led to some important but not so good outcomes because of that. I wonder whether you all have seen some of the same things in terms of either hand injuries or hand care or are there hand health? And let, let me uh, first turn to uh, uh, Dr. Wallet. Have you seen any effects of what's happened during COVID as it affects you and your profession? Well, we haven't seen it in clinic, but we also said that we were going to show up to clinic every day in spite of the lockdown. Now, we showed up as emergencies, okay? So any emergency could get to us. And we did that in kind of an emergency care. So the first week of lockdown, we were only seeing like 10 patients a clinic, but by the end of that lockdown, we were up to 45, 50 patients a clinic. And that's because they couldn't get in other places, but they could come see us over so their distal radius, for a flexor tendon laceration, for any other kind of stuff, we were seeing those people. Uh, our follow-ups, fortunately, within three weeks of the lockdown, we were allowed to have telemedicine. So we started to follow up on all the patients we still had O'Herring out there with a, a test or a problem and dealing with them in a distant way, but telling them the things that they could do. So we were very blessed within our practice to be allowed to continue to see emergency patients. Part of that is our clinic is right off a breezeway from the emergency room at doctor's hospital. So that allowed us to have that kind of ability. And then we would schedule only emergencies that fit the emergent criteria. So those patients did get their surgery. Uh, we did see two interesting things though, uh -huh. more carpal fractures because a significant other would poke the bear of their other significant other and that significant other would be angry enough to hit something. Fortunately, not the person that poked their, you know, jerked their chain. They hit a wall, something else. And so fortunately, we were able to you know, deal with those, but we did see a lot more fifth metacarpal fractures. We also saw a lot more dog bite because dogs were also getting very anxious and now they're home with the owners and the owners are anxious about everything that's going on because nobody understood what was happening and now you're the dogs. So mm -hmm. they would turn around and bite people just out of fear. And, uh, and so fortunately they, the dogs were contrite, the owners were contrite, and in the end, we uh, managed to get all the dog bites healed up too. So that was our experience with COVID. Uh, and Roy joined us just about that time. So, uh, uh, and Roy, I mean, and Matt, you were in New York at that point, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, my experience when I was in was actually quite different. Um, I was in New York right when COVID first hit the United States and New York was completely shut down. Um, and we were seeing a lot of interesting pathology that we hadn't seen before. Um, patients were developing clots within their hands and blood flow to their hands requiring mm -hmm. emergent operations. Um, but in terms of, we were at a point where we were locked down even for emergent surgeries. If you had a tendon laceration, we couldn't treat it um, because the ORs and the all the breathing devices, the you know, the ventilators were all being used for COVID patients. So we couldn't take patients to the operating room except for life or death situations. Um, so we ended up having to delay treatment for a lot of patients on things that we almost would never do. So I did see some different pathology in that situation. Thank you, Dr. Treiser. I want to quickly turn to prevention and how to keep your hands healthy. And a good place to start is how to, how to use your computer and how to set up a healthy workspace. Take a look at this real quick. So, you know, as a lot of people are working more remotely now, we need to really have proper, you know, ergonomics and just get proper setup. So let's kind of start first off with your chair height. If you don't mind staying ah. up for a second. Okay. You want to fit your chair height ideally so when you're sitting, you have about a 90 degree bend at your knees and about a 90 degree bend at your waist. So currently your chair is a little low. We'll adjust this height right here. Let's try this, Dr. Oskowski. All right, Corey. 
Ah, oh, much better already. You're right, that angle at the knees makes all the difference. It feels like my thighs are, are really making contact with the, with the seat now. We also, you know, your chair was too low before. We also want to make sure the chair is not too high. Mm. So you can see here, your feet are flat on the floor. Yes. If you have the chair too high, then your feet might not be touching the floor. Other recommendations, if you just put your arms out at your side here, mm -hmm. You can see your keyboard initially was a little bit scrunched. Let's yeah. move you in just a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're going to move the keyboard so it's a comfortable reach. Now, we don't want the keyboard yeah. too far. You can see at your Eskoski, if I move it further away, I have to reach for it more. Yeah, then you're really reaching, and that mm -hmm. puts a lot of stress here mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. on your neck mm -hmm. and on your back. Mm -hmm. So we want it so it's comfortable. What I'm noticing is looking at the screen, you're also looking down a little bit. That puts a little bit more stress in your neck. Uh. You can yeah. just imagine it's like holding a, holding a bowling ball, right? If you hold a bowling ball out here, I can't hold it very long. It's a lot of stress on me. Mm -hmm. But if I take the same bowling ball and hold it really close to my body, well, it's just much easier to hold. And that's the same thing with our neck. I'm actually going to raise your monitor up a little bit here. Okay. Oh, that's so I want huge. the monitor, so I do end up straight ahead. Yeah, I feel like I don't have to bend my neck now. I can, Absolutely. I can kind of have a straight line of sight. Our set, our fit to our workspace, that ergonomics, really important as we have more time with these things, COVID time and, and everything else. Probably from now on, we're probably going to be spending more time in this area. The, the proper fit can prevent that overload of tissue and, and keep us healthy. Well, thanks so much, Corey. Those were great tips. I, I feel better already. Great tips there. Dr. Cardoso, I also want to touch upon real quick the fact that so many people are texting on their cell phones today. Any advice you can give them about how not to injure their hands? And I've got about a, a minute or so, if you don't mind. So being aware of your posture while you're doing so, folks spend so much time on their cell phone. Perhaps they're hunched over. Perhaps they're overusing their thumbs. Think about getting a tendonitis in the thumb, but also worrying about your neck position, worrying about your back position, worrying about whether your elbows are in a in sort of a bent and pinched position for long periods of time. All of those things can affect um, your 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 nerves and and your uh, your tendons. Thank you so much, Dr. Cardoso. We've covered so much in this town hall, and I really want to get final thoughts from everyone as we wrap things up. Uh, Dr. Cardoso, let me start with you. Final thoughts, please. To remember that uh, even though we are hand surgeons, a lot of what we do is treating conditions without surgery. And so hopefully the patients are not fearful that when they're seeing a hand surgeon, the only offer, the only treatment that we offer is surgery. Fantastic. Love that. Dr. Treiser, I got about 30 seconds, if you don't mind. So I would echo what Dr. Cordoso said, but also we are hand surgeons. We deal with bony injuries, nerve injuries, um, arthritis, and you know even traumatic injuries. So if you you know we're always here, welcome to help patients with their hand issues. Great stuff. And uh, Dr. Wallet, you've shared so many personal stories, great examples. You really are the epitome of someone saying you can do anything, even with surgery, because you have done so. Final thoughts from you. I keep yourself healthy. You know, the, the most you can do for yourself is staying healthy, uh, be at peace with all of this. Things will work out. You can take care of it. Most things with hand, it doesn't matter when you do it. It just matters, you know, uh, uh, when you make the decision to do it, with the exception of those acute injuries. And you'll recognize when those are, and you'll be seeing us and going, and when you're taking us. We see from newborn to 100 years old. So we see everything. That's the interesting thing about hand, everything. And, uh, and so we want to try and keep you out of the OR if we can. Uh, but when we, we can't, we've got tricks and we've got things that we can do for you. Thank you. And we have great doctors like all of you, which is fantastic. Of course, Dr. Zinner, my co-host, who is virtual today. Final thoughts from you. Well, an incredibly important topic, a very common problem. And I'm glad we had such a wonderful panel tonight. Thank you all, been very helpful in sharing your information. Thank you. And I will say I got Thank a quick you, viewer question. So Dr. Wallet, I'm gonna throw it to you. Thanks I'm gonna give us. you 10 seconds to answer, but this uh, person wants to know, uh, <laughs> do anti-aging creams really work on women's hands? True or false? Dr. Wallet, you got about 15 seconds. <laughs> true, true, they, they do work. work.
<laughs> I'm 71 this year. They work. <laughs> well, there you go. That person now knows. And I'm assuming they work for men as well. <laughs> they do. <laughs> thank you so much. I want to thank our panel for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for your time and, of course, your insight. Dr. Zinner, thank you so much for always joining me on these town halls. I hope to see you right next to me next time. And I also want to thank our viewers who tuned in to watch and, of course, send in your questions for the panel. Be safe. Be careful with those frozen bagels and those avocados like they've just told us. And always, always call your doctor. I'm Olga Villaverde, and we'll see you next time. You take care. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel.